Dave, you have your, is your presentation? Yeah, I think it's here. Well, this is a perfect way to, to follow up on the previous speaker, because I want to say uh, the same thing. Uh, <laughs> it's a uh, chance to make up a lot of content. Uh, um, I'm thinking from the software point of view, I'm thinking from the digital computing point of view, I could give a crap about real biology. Uh, um, and it seems to me obvious that um, if we're going to have true evolution, open-ended evolution, we're going to have major evolutionary transitions uh, of Seth Martin and uh, John Maynard Smith, uh, or else whatever we have is not open-ended evolution. And so I will recapitulate the argument that was just made, that if we observe open-ended evolution over time, the individuals are going to get bigger and slower that we are considering. That's what it means. And if we are in a finite system, eventually we will reach a population size of one that lives forever, and evolution will stop, by definition. Uh, uh, like that. Okay. So if we actually want philosophical, theoretical, true open-ended evolution, it has to be an infinite system in the end. It has to be an indefinitely large system in the end. Now that may be completely irrelevant because all of the complexity that you could ever want and all the things that could keep you watching the simulation until you drop could happen in a completely finite system. It's all a matter of time and scale. Sure. Space-time bottom. So the first point is there's a lot of stuff we do where we take for granted what the creature is, or in the Packard and Bedell language, we take for granted what the component is that we are attempting to measure evolutionary activity of. And if we do that, we are dead. If we are do that, if we are stuck with the component that we have, and we cannot say now an exponential number of those guys, or even a linear number of those guys, I don't care, come together to form a transformer that marches down the road, whatever it is, uh, um, then we're stuck at the level that we started at. And we are going to observe at best climbing some kind of hill, perhaps very slowly, perhaps moving through some high hyperspace bypasses and ravines before we saw And maybe that, in fact, is as much open-ended evolution as we could hope to observe until we redefine what the, the components are. And let's go right to see it. So what I would like to propose is if we're going to have a satisfying, truly notion of open-ended evolution, and I'm not sure it's even available, well, I'm not sure if just, that's just one of the fantasy things that we induce from looking at very limited data. But if we want, we should be looking at it in a way that the components, the things that we think are evolving, are observables in the data and not priors that we define and put upon the system. Okay? That's step one. So, uh, uh, if we cannot say, okay, consider a creature K, consider a population N of creatures K, if we can't do that, then what do we do? You have to hard code something. Well, what we do is we start with an artificial chemistry or an artificial physics. We start one level down. And we say, yeah, we're willing to keep this, this level, absolutely fixed. We're willing to postulate this and say everything has to happen above that. But it has to happen above that, and above that, and above that, and above that. So we're going to find our components, we're going to find our creatures, our reproducing things, inside some kind of artificial physics chemistry. What kind of artificial physics or chemistry should it be? One of the great joys and sins of artificial life is that we get to make up the laws of physics anew for every damn paper. <laughs> and that's why people from the outside, by the way, think it's all crap. <laughs> sure, you could make it happen. You could it happen. It not happen. Uh, and then the next paper, you could it happen. It not happen. Uh, uh, now, of course, we know that life had to be that in the limit because life did happen, but it's not very satisfying. So the proposal I made last year at A Life, the proposal that has become my purpose in life, so it's part of every talk I give, is that satisfying models should be indefinitely scalable. It's not, it's unacceptable to say I have a 100 by 100 array 
you can say, uh, I have a rule, an update rule, that applies to anything. I'm going to do experiments on 100 by 100 array and also 200 by 200 array or whatever it is. But nothing changes about the framing of the model that couldn't be scaled up to arbitrarily large. And we all nod our heads and say, oh yeah, my model can do that. Uh, uh, but it turns out there are things that are not quite so obvious that don't scale. And the classic one for a life is a synchronous clock. The classic one for a life is imagining we have deterministic synchronous models. It definitely scaled the large. You cannot. So Conway's game of life. All traditional serial cyclotomata <coughs> out the window. Can't have them. So this argument has some bite. This argument says certain models are admissible, certain ones are not. So there's an increasing pile of papers about indefinite scalability. And basically, if you're willing to adopt a probabilistic cellular automata, where the probabilistic is reasonably real, so that you can't just assume away, I'll just do triple modular redundancy and assume away the probability, then you're, you're probably okay. Because cellular automata are spatially local, so they don't have a global clock, they don't have any global uh, synchronization requirements. So they're mostly good, but you have to give up on determinism. You have to give up on 100% reliability. If you're ready to do that, you're ready to build models that in some at least somewhat simple way could be transformable into other non-deterministic and definite scalable models. There is a hope that we could start having actually, instead of a brand new laws of physics in every paper, we can say, I am using an indefinitely scalable model. I am using an indefinitely scalable model. And in fact, we could think of a polynomial transform between his indefinitely scalable model and his indefinitely scalable model and actually start to build up some progress. That's it. All right, how do I make this thing go? That's All right, there we try. Here's my fantasy. I've talked to a couple of people about this since I've gotten here, because I wasn't sure whether this has already been done or proved impossible. And I don't know that either is true. But it seems to me this is what we ought to be able to do. Suppose you say, here is a digital cube, a billion by a billion by a billion. And one of the x and y is going to be a two-dimensional world, and t is going to be time. So we have this cube of bits. And we can take that as our model, and we can impose it upon reality any way we like. A finite volume of space-time granularity. Okay. So we could make individual bits go all the way down to quarks or Higgs bosons or whatever we want, or we could make those individual bits represent cells or people or planets. It's up to us. But we have this finite realm of space and time. And the question is, is evolution happening inside that? And if so, is evolution open-ended evolution happening inside that? Okay. And then we could say, we'll move our box around. We'll zoom in, we'll zoom out, we'll put it over here, we'll put it over there, and we'll look. And the way we do it is, okay, put your box someplace. You put it at the size of cells. So you really do not care about electrons. You're going to make some globbed model of everything below that and just live with it. Great. It's your choice. Okay. Uh, um, look at the first slice of time, do a spatial autocorrelation, shift the thing against itself, and look for repeating patterns. Look for nearly perfect repeating patterns. If you look for really perfect repeating patterns, you'll find crystals. Spatially absolute repeating patterns. You want nearly repeating. Nearly different but similar. And those are ones that are candidates for components. Those are the ones that are candidates to be creatures. And then you take those and you look over successive slices of time and you connect them together based on adjacency to make putative light lines. This guy at this slice is probably this guy at this slice. It's probably this guy at this slice. Oh, now there's two of them. They're probably related. You take the lifelines and you project them across time to get a phase space. Where now you have a line moving around corresponding to each lifeline. And you see how far it gets in the phase space compared to a random walk in that same phase space. And that's the neutral model, the shadow. And if it moves, you have evolution. 
If you can take then that model and zoom out to a larger scale and see those things happening again, then you have open-ended evolution. It's all on us, but it should all be post hoc. And that, I propose to you, is if we haven't done it already, then I wish someone would say we had a research proposal for the grand challenge for open-ended evolution. Thank you. Thank you.